Hi, Sandy Shellis, and I am. Uh, I wait a couple minutes before I start. I will be telling you that I'm going to talk about the fires in Southern California. They are upsetting, again, fear producing. It, it is, it's mind numbing. But there's explanations for all this happening. Uh, all of a sudden, I set this up, and I, <laughs> I can't, uh, I can't do anything about it because um, the fact that Facebook all of us just again decided to block me once again. And I wasn't even doing anything. I didn't share anything. All of a sudden, I tried to uh, do this live stream and share it. And here we go. So I want to start with this. It's really upsetting to see this happening. And yesterday, I put in, I put on a picture of people evacuating their horse, two horses, and I'm hoping that all of the wildlife that could get out and be bought out was taken out and that people did not leave behind their pets and and that this time there there was a, there is a concerted effort to help people and let them come in to the places the safety shelters with pets i hope that happens i don't know if it happened last time uh, but I guess we shall see, correct? Okay, I'm going to start with something from the California Chaparral Institute, which one of our followers, Evan Haig, has turned me on to. And they do discuss some of these things, and they have talked about the fire as a fast-moving active brush fire that started north of Santa Paula near Highway 50 and has burned into the city limits of Ventura and toward Highway 33. It's estimated at that point that it was 65,000 acres with 0% containment and is being pushed by strong east winds. Now, in the area down there, are the Santa Ana winds. This is historical, but they are being fanned by climate change. And climate change is something that we can no longer ignore or let people ignore. And as those of you who have followed me, I hope that you're always talking about these issues with people. Even if they look at you and they don't want to hear it, at least you get a little something in there, right? These fires, this is not the last of them. This is the beginning. The fire season is lasting longer because it is hotter. The temperatures are hotter. Global warming creates higher temperatures, creates drying out. Uh, landscape, right? And then f funneled by the Santa Ana winds. Most science says that human activity will spark a fire. Most likely it was human activity. And I'm not talking about directed energy weapons or micro laser weapons or the government starting these fires because they want to kill us. I'm talking about science and I'm talking about climate change. There is the information coming out about the Arctic and that as the ice melts, it's going to throw off the balance in, uh, in California to create more droughts. And this is all scientific. This has all been studied. In fact, I found a website that uh, it's a, let me see. Okay, it is. Here we go. Arctic sea ice loss could dry out California. This was Lawrence Livermore National 
laboratory. And I'll quickly say hi before I uh, do this. Hi, Kim, because I appreciate all of you. Hi, Jean. Uh, hello, Chris. Chris is very nice. You are the environment queen of the airways. <laughs> Thank you very much. Katie, Kathy, I mean, sorry, Kathy, hi. So thank you. Thank you for being here with me. It is, it's really very nice and I do appreciate it. Let me hide any messages. Okay, so let's go with this one because it's a good one. Arctic ice loss could dry out California. Arctic sea ice loss of the magnitude expected in the next few decades could impact California's rainfall and exacerbate future droughts, according to new research led by Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory scientists. The dramatic loss of, of Arctic sea ice cover observed over the satellite uh, era is expected to continue throughout the 21st century. There are so many variables involved in these things. The study identified a new link between Arctic sea ice loss and the development of an atmospheric ridging system in the North Pacific. The team found that sea ice changes could lead to convection changes over the tropical Pacific. These convection changes can turn a uh, drive it can in turn drive the formation of an atmospheric uh, ridge in Northern Pacific, resulting in significant drying over California. So there's scientific basis to why these are going on. And I firmly do not believe that there are any nefarious things happening to burn people out of their uh, properties, unless somebody was after Rupert Murdoch because his house is gone. And I don't think that that's the case. On average, when considering the 20 year mean, we find 10 to 15% decrease in California's rainfall. However, some individual years could become much drier and others much wetter. California's water pre precipitation has decreased over the last two decades with 2012 to 2016 drought being one of the most severe on record. Our study identifies one more pathway by which human activities could affect the occurrence of future droughts over California through human-induced Arctic sea ice decline. While more research should be done, we should be aware that an increasing number of studies, including this one, suggests that the loss of Arctic sea ice cover is not only a problem for remote Arctic communities but could affect millions of people worldwide. And we have to realize these things are happening. And it's happening right there in California. The California Chaparral Institute does put up, it's a great page, does put up protecting your home from fire, gives you a lot of information on focusing uh, why homes burn and why the almost exclusive focus on the clearance of native vegetation is counterproductive to our efforts to reduce fire risk. I will put up a, a, a link to California Chaparral in, Institute because I have found I found them to be very good, and I've enjoyed reading their uh, their stuff. The three most important factors in home flammability are location, eliminating the flammable features of your home and proper defensible space. Most homes burn from flying embers. So it's not the wild land vegetation, it's the location. They say looking at vegetation growing within roughly half a mile of structures, the authors concluded that the exotic grasses that often sprout in areas cleared of native habitat like chaparral could be more of a fire hazard than the shrubs. We ironically found that homes that were surrounded mostly by grass actually ended up burning more than homes with higher fuel volumes like shrubs. So you see, there are rational, scientific 
reasons for why this is happening. And they talk about the flying embers that ignite most homes because homes are flammable. Windblown embers, which can travel one mile or more, were the biggest threat to homes. In the 2007 Witch Creek Wildfire in San Diego, uh, California, there were few, if any, reports of homes burned as a result of direct contact with flame from wildland fuels. Now that's back in 2007, so things have changed quite a bit. I mean, we have exponentially changed in our temperatures. It is a term you need to get used to, exponential, because that is what's happening to us. The more crap we put in the air, the more we pollute, the more it's going to affect the Santa Ana winds in California that are already a natural force. But we have built and built up California to where this is going to happen. Million dollar homes are going to be lost. We want to mitigate loss of life. We want to mitigate animal loss of life. And California Chaparral says a wet home keeps the embers and flames at bay because they talk about putting external sprinklers. They are an effective way to prevent a home from igniting during a wildfire. Such an approach is uncommon because traditionally home fires are, have started inside. So they have internal sprinklers. They're saying external sprinklers coupled with an independent water supply, a swimming pool or a water tank should be required for all homes within high, extremely high fire hazard zones. Clusters of homes should be served by a community water tank that should be a requirement for every planned development. I don't know if that's the case. 100 feet of defensible space work. More is usually counterproductive. How much defensible space? In a study of over one half a million homes, it was found that the most effective measures to reduce structure loss are to reduce the percentage of woody cover up to 40% immediately adjacent to the structure and to ensure that vegetation does not overhang or touch the structure. There are USGS's summaries of these studies that can be had. The amount of cover reduced is as important as the fuel modification distance. However, complete removal of cover is not necessary. The term clearance should be, re, be replaced with fuel modification to emphasize the fact. Right now, well, earlier today, the mandatory evacuations included the city of Santa Paula, the uh, Santa Paula unincorporated area towards Ventura, the city of Ventura, uh, uh, many different places in Ventura, Oakview, entire community of Casita Springs, East Ojai Valley, Upper Ojai Valley, Ventura County North area. And they wanted to have voluntary evacuations in the city. And this is just an example of the preparation we're going to have to make for the future that is going to change from our climate. And the climate is not going to change because I don't think we're going to be fast enough to mitigate the reasons why our earth is warming. We have tried. And then we have a, a, an environment that just is ripe for corruption. And all of these politicians, all they care about from the top all the way down is money. So this kind of thing, we've got to get used to it. We have to get used to it. It is happening all over the world as Sheila, my good friend, so sad what is happening everywhere in the world today. Yeah, it is sad. It's very sad. What happens though, the things that get me upset are when people don't want to admit that abrupt climate change is happening and that they would rather believe 
that this is something that is a forced government plot, the New World Order. Hey, I'm not saying I don't believe in the New World Order. The Koch brothers laid it out. The libertarians laid it out. I mean, we know what happens, but I don't think that there are any directed energy weapons. If anybody wants to debate me, that's fine. I'm not an expert, but I will try to get my ducks in a row. <sighs> Higher temperature. It's been hot in California. And in the five-year drought, the area was doubled by 16,000 square miles. And the fire season is lasting longer. So it's really not, um, it's not something that we shouldn't just understand. We're going to warm by 3.5 degrees Celsius. What are we going to do? Mitigation? Nobody's changing. The government doesn't want to change. Well, Patrick's here and he says, hello, Sandy. OMEC restores the sea ice, which would limit the amount of fires in California by lowering SSTs and global average temperatures on land, sea, and air. I have been trying to work out a way to get Patrick to come on with me to talk about all this, his ocean tunnel, ocean tunnel work. It is a geoengineering type of solution, but it's not geoengineering like we think of geoengineering. It's not chemtrails. It's not anything um, sinister. It is something that Patrick thinks could work, and I would love to have him on the show. Uh, very, uh, Tresita says variable flat facts, oh, my God, are so rare. <laughs> Verifiable facts, yeah. The and uh, Jean says the visuals of the Arctic and the uh, Antarctic ice are very distract, distressing, and of course it is. And our friend Torstein Vidal is living in Greenland. He's recording this on the Arctic ice page, Arctic sea ice page on Facebook every day. He's the one that knows what's going on. Last night I was perusing YouTube. And I found a climate denier video where this guy was reading junk science to tell us that the Arctic ice is growing and that uh, it's not melting. Greenland is just fine. You know, these are the dangerous ones. These are the people that get to weaker people and they believe this. They believe this. The Arctic is not rebounding. Yes, there have been predictions that there would be a blue ocean event or that the Arctic would be melted faster than before. Uh, it's 2017. Maybe we've bought some time. Of course, that's a lot of the other scientists area to discuss. Now, Paul Beckwith said he was on last night talking about the fires on the BBC World. I couldn't get it, so I'm really anxiously awaiting his videos and his discussion on the fires. Okay, I'll do this. Rupert, <laughs> Karma is such a piot. You know, it's never, ever a laughing matter. And hi, Justin. Justin, part of our, our team. He's a good help. Oh, gosh, so many of you would join me. Well, I mean, really, what more is there to talk about other than the fact that this is what's happening? And, oh, Amy. Amy says a friend out there and I were talking earlier today, and they haven't gotten the rains they've usually gotten by now. No, it's completely not the way it should be. And I'm sure that Kevin Sandblum on Red Llama will be addressing this on YouTube too, because I freaked out and yesterday and I frantically private messaged him to make sure that he and his family were okay because he lives in Southern California. 
oh my gosh, he wrote me, he's okay. It's a different area. But I, I was like really freaking out. And um, I have friends there and my family is there in, in Los Angeles. So of course these all hit home. They hit home for every one of us. Just like the hurricane that hit Florida. We all have people in Florida. We all have people in California and we care. But let's care about the right things. Let's care about what's happening. Let's care about personal responsibility to live as clean a life as we can. I can't say if it's going to do something to eradicate runaway climate change. I can't. But I know that for all of us, taking personal responsibility makes us feel better and makes us feel part of an environment and a culture of answers, a culture of, I won't say hopium so much, but a culture where if we all collectively live differently, and it is hard, I know that, I, I know that with the supermarket and plastics. I know that with vehicles. I know that with, with all of it, you know, landfills and, and, and all of the things that are, are egregious in our life, notwithstanding the refuglicants. Unfortunately, the, um, Bears Ear Monument and Alaska have gotten to me to a point where I have been crying. I'm not going to start now, but it is upsetting because we sit here, all of us, Candace, who's with us, and, and, and Kim and Jean, we sit here, all of us, feeling powerless over what to do to save our environment, to save our planet. So I say it's the re local responsibility, you know, in your home, in your community. And I'm not going to stop saying the 2018 elections are our last shot at getting these people out and getting a progressive agenda in because I think that's the only way we're going to save the planet. And you know I'm never going to give a time because I don't know. So for today, we've talked about the fires. We've talked a little bit about the causes. We've talked a little bit about people's runaway imaginations climate deniers when it's all right right here in front of us right here in front of us i do have one little last bit of housekeeping to do with you guys those of you who know that my husband had that motorcycle accident july 15th and then we were hit by a tornado july 20th well we had a gofundme and my husband was the most grateful person you have ever seen because we found out that he will never regain most likely the use of his left arm to go above his head. He can't, there's no nerves that are telling the muscle what to do. It's like in a car uh, or, or uh, yeah, there's no electrical wire saying lift. My husband was a roofer, cider, outdoor worker. He was building a greenhouse and he does so much around here. He hasn't stopped, but he's limited. He can't climb the ladders. He can't do the things that he did around our home before. But what I didn't want to do here is there's no cry, woe is me, because we are both survivors and both doers. I wanted to thank everybody again that donated to us through the GoFundMe and who supported us throughout that whole ordeal. I wanted to come on and say that today because I have gratitude and people were extremely generous with the GoFundMe, which is all he has. And uh, I'm not going to cry. The helicopter company is going after us for $30,000. Um, the insurance paid $30,000 of a $30,660 bill. So we've had to do um, some things to protect us, but it's the unfairness of the system 
and the unfairness of what the political arena is doing to all of us in the United States and other countries that follow our lead. And we are just one tiny little example of it. I don't know what we're going to do yet. I don't know anything. I know that I'm a disabled person and I've told all of you that. I've had three back surgeries and I had to retire medically from my wonderful HR career job. And uh, I don't whine about it, but I am the one, you know? And it is, it is, um, it is tough. But I do this out of a labor of love because I really love all of you. And even on YouTube, I've made some amazing connections on YouTube. And I want to thank everybody from YouTube as well. We'll get by. We're survivors. I'm going to get the solar system that I might be able to afford. And I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. Thanks for joining me today. Let's send all of our healing karma to everyone in Ventura and Los Angeles where the, where the fires are hitting. Healing karma. We want the animals to be saved and the people to be saved. Possessions don't mean anything, and I've learned that several times in my life. It's what's in here. And I have a lot of what's in here for a lot of you out there. So thanks for coming. I'll make it short and sweet. Sharon, you yeah, end with a heart. And if you could share this for me, it would be nice. Maybe some people will learn something. The Santa Ana winds are real. Climate change is real. Peace, everybody. I really love you. I do. Bye.